Hold on tight, tight for, the for the next hour. hour. You're, entering You're entering into a place, a zone called the alternative, the alternative to the alternative media. media. It's a place, a special place, where even truth seekers fear to tread. All right, people, let's move like we've got a purpose. Affirmative. Okay, boys and girls, welcome back for another edition of the Investigative Journal. Hope you listened to the President's State of the Union address. It was a well-scripted uh, speech, and some people said it was probably one of the best State of the Union speeches any president has given. And what would you expect for this uh, Hollywood production? The Trump administration should win the Academy Award for the one, best actor, political actor in a role as president. Two, best scene. <laughs> they should, you know, block it off into scenes at the State of the Union where he even got all these freshman women, congresswomen, to stand up and cheer for him, all dressed in white. Did you, did you watch that? <laughs> Amazing. It was a great political scene. And uh, I have to hand it to you, the director and the producers of that one particular episode should get an Emmy Award, right, an Emmy Award for that episode, Trump State of the Union speech 2019. And uh, as we move forward after that, I listened to the commentary by all the Hollywood critics on Fox and uh, CNN and even CNN had to admit that 76% of the people who listened to the speech enjoyed it. So the ratings were high. The money's coming. No commercials either. No commercials. Just a commercial-free um, sitcom, right? And when I say sitcom, I really mean that. Because uh, everything in, in Washington is basically just like what you see in Hollywood. It's kind of like when NASA sends a rocket ship up to the moon, that's the same as if you watch that movie 2012 or any of these science fiction movies about going to Mars, things like that. They're all the same because reality that you're presented in politics and in your daily world is really not reality. It's basically fiction. So how do you find the reality, the real reality? Well, that's why you come to my show. That's it. The show that is the alternative to the alternative media, the purveyor of truth that I am, the top of the ladder here. We go right to the very top and take the onion apart and show you exactly how you're being screwed. And so I'd like to say that this show has been on the air for a long, long time. And I consider it one of the best. Yes, I do. And I think you should listen to it because you're going to get things here that you never get anyplace else. And you're going to break it down very simply that your world has been basically turned upside down by these people. And we try to talk about it every day here. Now, somebody sent me this article and said, Greg, you got to read this because it's quite interesting. And I said I would because I had no idea about any of this, some of this stuff, Interpol, international police, that Hitler took over the Interpol. Okay, so we're going to talk about it. And uh, the person that sent it uh, said uh, has a thing called transmissions and supposedly has some inside information on this. But he, uh, the, it says this, it said, uh, Greg, sometimes before World War II, Adolf Hitler took over the international police. Okay. That's possible. I mean, he's taken over France, he's taken over Italy, and all these other countries. I'm sure he could take over the police. And we know that Hitler is a creation of Pope Pius XII and the Vatican. So, uh, let's move forward. A top official of Interpol with dual capacity was uh, J. Edgar Hoover, okay, of uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. His office he was vice president of Interpol, they say, was in the U.S. Treasury Building, Washington, D.C. And he says, he, this person is one of the, of the few that dares mention these dirty little secrets of the FBI. He said they were formed in the 20s. That's, that's not what they tell us, is it? 
in uh, what he describes as, well, it could have been, where I thought they were, it had something to do with Al Capone, didn't it? Yeah, so uh, he says as, uh, describes as the mists and the vapors of antiquity. Then and now it operates without a charter. Okay, so it's just a law enforcement agency by the feds, but there's no charter? Don't they have it written down somewhere? It has no statutory or no other authority to exist at all. That's interesting. I wouldn't have known that. Now, whatever you may think about the CIA, <laughs> what I think about it, the Catholic in Action Organization, uh, good or bad, they have operated under a charter that was formed in 1947. Now, we talked about the how the OSS transitioned into the CIA, and this was, a lot of the strategy was done in Rome with the Pope Pius XII, that was the same mentor of Hitler. And um, some, some people say, well, how does the Vatican get involved with all this stuff? Well, let's take an aside here, and we'll get back to this. But did you find it interesting that the Pope, yesterday, or the day before, he went to the, made a first papal visit in Saudi Arabia. Muslim, okay, Muslim country, I guess, and uh, you know he's giving the first mass ever attended in uh, by people in that country. So they're doing a pagan mass in a country that supposedly will not allow you to read a Bible, but lets the Pope in, and then they say it's they allow Christians in. Well, first of all. Catholics aren't Christians. And secondly, they've been there a long time. There's been, you know, speculation that the, uh, that Islam is a creation of this organization, the Catholic Church. And if you read the Quran and the catechisms and the Catholic traditions, you'll find there's so many similarities. And I find it interesting in Muslim countries that persecute Christians, they allow a church on one corner and a, and a Catholic church on one corner and a mosque on the other. Do they have an agreement? So we have to separate Christianity from Catholicism. So the Pope heads over there, gives a speech, and he calls for unity. And uh, you know what that is, unity and error. And this is one step closer to that world government, world religion uh, idea we're talking about. And, of course, all of the people on the news stations in America were applauding this. The great holy man heads over and tries to unite the world. United for what? We'd be better off if he just stayed in the Vatican. You know, give them a hundred acres, let them play golf, put a golf course out there, and the whole world would be a lot better off. I used to walk through there all the time. I mean, I can, I'm can. i thinking back now. All the days of my life that I walked through the Vatican, there were many, because I lived in Rome for almost seven years. And uh, I strolled through the Vatican and St. Peter's Square hundreds of times. And I was just thinking, wouldn't it be nice if they just walled it off? Well, there is a wall. So we have now Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats saying the wall is immoral, but they they bow down and kiss the Pope's ring, and he lives behind a wall. And how many of these elites in America don't have bodyguards, armed security, live behind walls? The only wall that's immoral is the one that we want to put on the southern border because it will prevent the Democrats from bringing in all these people that are going to vote for them illegally. And not only that, it's going to prevent everybody coming in here to create chaos so that the world can, this country can be destabilized. That's really what the hell's going on. So I'm thinking walking through the Vatican walking through St. Peter's Square. I wish they would just put the wall higher, give them some more recreational facilities, put in a swimming pool. I imagine they have one, I don't know. Put in a golf course and let them just stay there. Forget it. Uh, so, back to this idea of 
FBI doesn't have a charter and the CIA and all this stuff and Interpol. Now, toward the end of World War II, Nazi officials, okay, some of them having committed war crimes, had their escape from Europe arranged by the Pope. We've talked about the rat lines. As a cover, he arranged the, them Vatican passports, dressed in garments befitting priests. They escaped down uh, what some authors have called the Vatican rat lines. Now, this has been, you know, documented. I can remember seeing a couple depositions filed in cases against the Vatican that actually CIA, uh, former CIA officials testified to this. So it's fact, there are facts leading up to you understanding that the Vatican helped the Nazis get into Argentina through the red lines escaping the crimes against humanity. So why would we allow an organization like this in America when we were fighting the Nazis? It doesn't make sense to me. And so what I'm saying is there's a cover-up deeper than you, you know, bigger than you've ever thought. And none of the people in America even want to, you know, they'll go back in history when it suits them, but they don't want to go back to this history. And that's why I said, the other day, this ties into Father Edmund Walsh, who was the head of the foreign, he started the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown and then was put on Eisenhower's website. He was given a White House eulogy. And what I said was he was sent, this is factual, sent to the Nuremberg trials to oversee the judge there to make sure some of this stuff happened. Not only to make sure that nothing got in the record that the Vatican was instrumental in backing the Nazis. So we have not, they say there's a double standard in America towards our justice system now. There's a double standard towards everything regarding the Vatican. They're given free hand here to do what they want. And none of this stuff ever gets brought up. And if people knew it, you know, we would not have this problem here. But going back to uh, many of these Gestapo and these Nazi officials were on the Allied list of those to be questioned and presumably prosecuted at the Nuremberg tribunals and elsewhere. That's why Edmund Walsh was sent there to make sure these guys got out. Most of them ended up in Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, Bolivia, <laughs> and there's a substantial portion in the United States. So let's talk about this for a second. A substantial portion of Nazi war criminals get into the United States with fake IDs, fake passports, and they're protected by none other than the, probably the CIA, the FBI. Now, I remember one time, I was sent on a story up in northern Idaho, and there's a lake there. I forget the name of it. It's the deepest freshwater lake in our country, supposedly. And there you'll find a small Navy base, a little military base. And apparently they test atomic submarines there. Very, very secretive area. So I went there to check it out. And it's a beautiful little town, and you drive around this lake, and there was a little entrance to get into this, and I could see actually the docks where the submarines will go up and down, right? And you didn't see many. Now wait. So I tried to get in, and I was said it was it was not it was off limits. It was a secret secret area off limits to average people for national security reasons. So I started talking to people in town, and I said I was here to do a story about this place. And they said, well, you should do a story about some of the Nazi war criminals that live here in these mansions, that have been here for years given Ameri by American, given American assistance. And so I said, oh, really? And they said, yeah, drive up there. You'll see a place. And there's one of them. And I said, what's his name? He said, well, I don't know. They, they've, it's probably not his real name. So I drove around. 
And I said, are there really submarines in this lake, these atomic subs? And so as I was driving, and you're going up a little mountain road, and this lake is beautiful, beautiful place, I did see a submarine surface and a helicopter come down. So basically, we have Nazis living in Idaho. Okay. Thanks to the Vatican red lines. Now, to understand, now we said that all these people through the rat lines were going to South America, but to understand South America, it's got to be understood that by 1910, some thought Argentina might well outdistance the U.S. in business and other developments. Okay? During World War II, Argentina was pro Nazi. Becoming a shipping magnate prior to the conflict, Aristotle Onassis, remember him during the war, used Argentinian ships, immune from German U-boats and Nazi pocket battleships, to transport war goods to Germany. The patriarch of the Kennedy family, Joseph P. Kennedy, returned from London in 1945, having been U.S. ambassador. Kennedy, despite being Irish, was acceptable to pro-Nazi British royalty as a major bootlegger, criminal with paid-for corrupt immunity in the 20s. He heavily smuggled Scottish whiskey items into the U.S. to benefit the British monarchy. Now, Kennedy tried to tell President Roosevelt to remain neutral but to not get involved in Europe uh, because, said Kennedy, Hitler was winning as having been highly corrupt maritime commissioner in the Roosevelt White House, Kennedy already was in lucrative corrupt deals with shipping tycoon Onassis. Okay. With the wartime Nazi complicity of Argentina and the founding Father Kennedy, Aristotle became fabulously wealthy. And with the aid of the Pope's rat line and the aid and comfort provided by the pro-Nazi Catholic Church, in Jesuit hierarchy in Argentina, Buenos Aires became a protected haven for war criminals. So, for many years after the war, Hitler's brainchild, Interpol, was dominated principally, principally by escaped Nazi war criminals. And what was Interpol's specialty? Using their worldwide telecommunication empire, Interpol sent out throughout the planet urgent bulletins to law enforcement authorities uh, that wanted as fugitives from justice were various persons, principally small-time and medium businessmen. A revealing compilation of the, those wanted orders showed that many of those thus fingered and held to be in custody until further notice had Jewish surnames. Upon further scrutiny, the offenses that these Jews were wanted for were mostly petty matters, mostly possible, not, <laughs> not really serious crimes. Certainly such small-time deeds did not warrant worldwide declarations as if they were all bank robbers and such. Bluntly put, these post-war surviving Nazis supported the Catholic Church and the Jesuit hierarchy were continuing their bloodlust. Jews killed Jesus, we're going to get you. J. Edgar Hoover, in his role with Interpol, certainly was beset by strange cross-currents, a high corrupt Booze Baron named uh, Rosenstiel to bribe Hoover, set up foundation to profit Hoover under the table. Purportedly a Jew, Rosenstiel ran uh, a big business. And even more strange, Rosenstiel's firm had a secret owner, pro-Nazi Joe Kennedy. So, you're just getting a little glimpse of how this operated. Many people have said that Hitler never died in the bunker and that Hitler ended up in Argentina. And uh, remember the sub that uh, some people saw, had eyewitnesses, uh, that Hitler did not die in that bunker and ended up there, lived to be, what, 90 years old or something? Yeah, I mean, anything can happen with these people. And you would think if Hitler was a, uh, a pawn set up by the Vatican and the powers that be here, that if he, if Germany finally was invaded, they could fake his death, he would be paid off for his loyalty and given another identity 
and moved elsewhere. Now they could have, they've probably done the same with other leaders they've put in power. Bin Laden, uh, who else? Uh, Saddam Hussein. I imagine if the push comes to shove or something happens in North Korea, the same would happen with that guy. Because he's on their payroll as well. Because what we talk about here uh, puts us in the forefront of what I consider to be valid, valid questions based on certain facts in the past that are overlooked is these people all work together and there is a conspiracy at the top levels to create this one world order, one world government by members of our own Democratic and Republican parties working together. And this fight you see in America now between the left and the right is just a stage show. It's chaos, unbridled, unbridled chaos to create a new America, to create a one world. And they can't have a one world with America remaining strong and sovereign. So that's what we do here. And what I try to do is give credit to these people who are actually the founding fathers of America, who actually don't get credit for writing these great scripts like Trump speech yesterday and other things. I mean, these people are so humble, these Jesuits and all of these other New World Order elites. They don't even want credit for it. And all of you people out there who blindly, without researching, say that a one world government and all of this global order and uh, climate change and all of these things are so good. Socialism is so good. I'd least like you to know who your elite mentors are and where they come from and how they do this. And I think that if you really understood how and what they did, you would be surprised. And maybe you'd want America to be like it was in the 50s. <laughs> now, throughout the years, I've tried to piece this story apart. I mean, step by step, inch by inch. And the, the more interesting it gets, the, the, the more I, I look and see how people don't believe it. Because it is so <laughs> huge. It's, it's so encompassing that it, the control is so from, you know, vast. It goes from the smallest Alex Jones people on the internet to the largest, most powerful people in the world, all putting this story together for one reason to keep you ignorant of a lot of the little facts I did maybe just mentioned or mentioned throughout the years. And it's just amazing to me that, you know, well, it's not amazing to me because all the people with money and power can buy anything. That's why people like, let's, let's, let's give you an example. People on the left, people on the right, you know who they are in government. They make my, billions of dollars, millions of dollars, as well as the top news broadcasters who are really only, only party puppets now or PR people for their, their cause. They make millions. So it's not amazing to me that the guidelines are set that a lot of things that we talk about here cannot be discussed because it would not makes sense in their game plan and everyone else you know basically that wants to get to the truth will be marginalized and when you listen to a lot of these facts you will say they can't be true this guy's crazy that's exactly what they want to do but we'll continue with the craziness in three minutes on the investigative journal the book of revelation says the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, 
and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager, most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a Third Temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built, that's crossTheBorder.org. The following, the following program, program is labeled dangerous, dangerous and off limits by the Supreme, by the Supreme Jesuit, Jesuit command. command. But stand, but stand all, all people, people. Listen, listen up, 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 and you, you may, may just, just learn, learn something. something. Oh dear Lord, Jesus, this ain't happening, man. This can't be happening, man. This ain't happening. Okay, folks, back for the second half hour. We're going to shift gears a little bit in the second half hour. I do make want to want to make one comment about an email I received regarding a uh, radio program done in a video fashion on YouTube regarding someone by the name of Kevin Annette. Now, Kevin Annette is not an unfamiliar name to me. As 10 to 15 years ago, I've spent many, many hours interviewing him as well as his story, as well as many of the supposed, well, they were victims of the genocide of Native Canadians by the Jesuit mission schools. And Kevin and Nett then went on to create, uh, what, the World Court or something. Now, the only thing I'm going to say about this is go back to my shows and then look at Kevin and Nett and say, is this really possible? I find there was a lot of, uh, I believed him hook, line, and sinker. But as the years went on, when I spoke to other people, one, an investigator from the Tamaki Law Firm named Ken Bearchief, a Native American, studying and working a case on the same genocide by the Jesuits of the mission schools in America, he had a number of red flags and doubts about the validity and truthfulness and Kevin Annette's real mission. And to make a long story short, what side he was really on. So I'm not going to make a complete negative judgment about this man, but there are a number of things that are very strange in the reporting that I did, looking back on it, what had happened during those reports, as well as information I received from some credible people regarding Mr. Annette. So I just wanted to make a comment on that. Okay, secondly, uh, I always found it interesting in my quest to understand uh, the truthfulness 
regarding, and let's put faith aside, but there are people who believe that Jesus was a Messiah. There are people that believe he was strictly a prophet. There are others that say it was a fictitious story based on myths. Now, whatever camp you're in, I always found it interesting that why wasn't there any more information about him between the years when he was born and many of those years up until he was 32 or 33 years old. And I said, there's got to be information. If he was such a threat to the Roman Empire, then there has to be documentation because the Romans were fastidious in their record keeping. Every trial was meticulously written down. And so I would think they would send out investigators to find this supposed Messiah and get to the bottom of who he was, but there's nothing. Uh, until I read a book, and you may know about it. If not, get it. It's interesting. It's called the Arco Volume, or the Archaeological Writings of the Sanhedrin and Talmuds of Jews. And it's supposedly about an American minister back in the 1800s who, through chance, met someone who was a researcher, a German gentleman who was trekking through the United States and apparently they ended up communicating and the pro this this uh, minister ended up going to Rome and getting in the Vatican archives and uncovering the very information that I'd wondered about my whole life and I can remember as a kid growing up in a Catholic school uh, wondering, why didn't they talk about Jesus as a boy? And you're always told, you know, this is the important things. If God would have wanted that to be known, he would have put it in the Bible or something. But anyway, it still didn't uh, quench my thirst of curiosity. You know, growing up to be a journalist, my questioning never ends. And so what is wrong with asking the question, what was Jesus doing all those years between the time that he was born and the time that he died on the cross? And it would have been nice to know. Was he performing any miracles? Like, for example, at the age of 11, maybe they had a, an ancient type of baseball game. And he was playing on one team and he basically made sure or that his team won by creating a miracle of hitting a home run or something. Or maybe he was a, uh, you know, kind of gregarious type of kid that made a lot of jokes. Or maybe he played just like normal kids. Did he ever do anything wrong? Did he disobey Mary? Did he fail to uh, do his homework? Did he sin? I mean, all these, did he, did he lie to his mother? I mean, supposedly Jesus can't do that, but did he? As a kid, you don't know things, right? I remember one time as a child, <laughs> uh, my mom sent me to the, uh, I remember this, uh, she sent me to the drugstore back in the old days, and I walked in there, and I bought what she sent me for. And I looked, there was a little ice cream machine. You ever see those? And it said, serve yourself. I interpreted it, that to mean they were free. So I took two or three ice cream cones and left. And I got home and my mother said, where'd you get those? You didn't have money for that. I said, well, it said, serve yourself. So she walked me back to the store. And we told the pharmacist that, I had made a mistake and we paid for the ice cream cones. So did Jesus ever do anything like that? Did he sleep good at night? I mean, there's all these little things that would have added a lot to his personality. Was he very talkative? Uh, did he ever kiss a girl? Did he ever, uh, I don't know, go fishing? Since he, you know, that miracle with the fish, I was wondering if he ever really went fishing as a kid. Now, the idea that uh, I'd like to know what he did is personal, and I'm sure it has nothing to do with anything. I'm not trying to denigrate or, you know, rip apart Christianity. I'm just saying, what happened? 
And so, as I found this book, the Arco volume, I started reading it. And the minister said the same thing about the Romans being very meticulous in their record keeping, and there should be something. So he started researching, and he went to the Vatican, and back then it was easy to, easier to get into the Vatican archives. Now it's protected like Fort Knox. And I heard that most of it is digital now. That's interesting. But a lot of these old books, they can't digitalize, can they? They got to keep them, you know, where you can touch them and feel them. I mean, they're written, in the, you know, hundreds of years ago. But anyway, he found the records, and the Arco volume goes through how he found the records, his trek to Rome, how he met the person that uh, led him to this information. And then it talks about all the information that he received, that he got from the Vatican and printed this. Now, since the Arco volume has been published, some people say he's credible, some people, of course, say he made it up. So you're going to have to decide. But in the effort to be uh, open and transparent, this is uh, basically what he found out. He found out that there was an investigator sent out to find who this young Messiah was. And he was sent to these towns to interview people like Joseph, Mary, his friends, anybody that knew him, and, and trying to find Jesus himself. So the guys, the investigator for the Roman Empire was named Gamaliel, Gamaliel, and uh, it, this was found in the Saint Sophia Mosque at Constantinople. The records brought back to the Vatican, made by Gamaliel in the Talmuds of the Jews in 27 B.C. Okay, it seems Gamaliel was sent by the Sanhedrin to interrogate Joseph and Mary in regard to the child Jesus. He says, quote, this is the record of Gam Gamaliel, translated, of course, I found Jesus and Joseph, or excuse me, I found Joseph and Mary in the city of Mecca, in the land of Ammon or Moab, but I did not find Jesus. When I went to the place where I was told he was, he was somewhere else. And thus I followed him from place to place until I despaired of finding him at all. What, you know what I got from this? How could a Roman investigator not catch a kid? Did Jesus kind of like disappear? You know, like Gamaliel's right on his tail coming into the house and all of a sudden he just disappears and goes somewhere else. I don't know. He's God. He can do what he wants. But I find it difficult that if he was around that area, that this investigator couldn't track him down. He was only a kid. But did, just, did Jesus know that he was being sought after and didn't want to be caught? Well, whether he knew, this is Gamaliel speaking, whether he knew I was in search of him and, and did it to elude me, I cannot tell. Though I think it must most likely the former was the reason, for his mother says he is bashful and shuns company. Okay, so he spoke to Mary, and Mary said that Jesus was a bashful child and didn't like to be around people. Hmm. Now, what would that be today? If he was a kid like that, would he go into psychological counseling? <laughs> Think about it. Would he go into psychological counseling? And would and would people say, boy, that's a strange boy. We've got to watch out for him. He's quiet. He doesn't like people. And, uh, you know, what they always say about those type of people, right? Those type of kids. But anyway, so G all we know now is that Mary told Gamaliel that Jesus was shy and bashful. Now, he said this, Joseph is a wood workman. He is very tall and ugly. His hair looks as though it might have been dark auburn when young. His eyes are gray and, vi and vicious. He is anything but uh, pre-proposing in, uh, in his appearance, and he has a gross and glum, as, and he is as gross and glum 
as he looks. He is a, a poor talker and seems that yes or no are the depth of his mind. So Joseph isn't portrayed as a very, uh, very uh, interesting individual, right? I'm satisfied he is very disagreeable to his family. His children look very much like him, and upon the whole I should call them a third-rate family. I asked him who were his parents, and he said his father's name was Jacob, and his grandfather was Matthew. He did not like to talk on the subject. He is very jealous. I told him that we had heard that he had had a vision and uh, was sent to ascertain the facts in the case. Uh, he said he was sent to, uh, no, he said uh, he did not call it a vision. He called it a dream. Uh, he said uh, after he and Mary had agreed to marry, it seemed that something told him that Mary was with child, that he did not know whether he was asleep or awake, but it made such an impression on him that he concluded to have nothing more to do with her. And while he was working one day under a shed, all at once a man in snowy white stood by his side and told him not to doubt the virtue of Mary, or she was holy before the Lord. All right. It's quite a story, right? So, can you imagine this guy? Mary's with child, and some guy in snowy white comes down and tells him, don't worry, she's a virgin. Man, I'm telling you, that wouldn't fly with 99% of husbands in any country of the world today. What's your first thought going to be? Man, she cheated on me. But anyway, we'll go on. You can read between the lines yourself. But uh, that he, then the child conceived in her was not by a man, but by the Holy Ghost. And that the child would be free from human passions. All right, so what we learn now is that Mary's the Immaculate the Immaculate Conception, the Holy Ghost, and Jesus is not going to have human passions. All right. In order to do this, he must, uh, that is, his humanity must, he of the extract of, uh, what, of the house of Hebrew, when then they give the word for virgin, that he might endure all things and not resist and fill the demands of prophecy. He said the angel told him that this child should be great and should rule all of the kingdoms of the world. He said that this child should set up a new kingdom wherein should dwell righteousness and peace and that the kingdom of the world which should oppose him uh, would utterly, God would utterly destroy one day. I asked him, how could a virgin conceive of herself without the germination of a male? He said, this is the work of God. He has brought to life the womb of Elizabeth, so she had conceived and will bear a son in her old age who will go before and tell the people of the coming of this king. Wow, that's an amazing, amazing story. Okay, so here we have Gamaliel. He is now investing talking to Joseph. Now, put yourself in the shoes of Joseph then, right? Would you believe that? What just uh, was said? I wouldn't. I mean, I'd say, come on. Who is this ghost talking to me? I'm just saying, you know, as a human being, it's a pretty tall tale to listen to at that time, right? Okay? Uh, so he said this is the work of God. That's why he believes that Mary uh, will conceive of herself without the germination of a male. Uh, after telling, now Gamal Leo says, after telling me these things, he disappeared like the melting down of a light. That's the ghost. 
I then went and told, and told Mary what had occurred, and she told me that the same angel, or one like him, had appeared to her and told her the same things. So I married Mary, thinking that if what the angel had told us was true, it would be greatly to our advantage. But I am fearful we are mistaken. This is Joseph talking. Jesus seems to make to take no interest in us, nor anything else much. I call him lazy and careless. I do not think he will ever amount to much, much less to be a king. If he does, he must do a great deal better than he has been doing today. Hmm. Okay. I asked him how long after that interview with the angel before the child was born. And he said he did not know, but he thought it was seven or eight months. I asked him where they were at the time. He said in Bethlehem. The Roman commander had given orders for all of the Jews to go on a certain day to be enrolled as taxpayers, and he and Mary went to Bethlehem as the nearest place of enrollment. And while there is a babe was born, okay, I asked if anything strange occurred that night. He said that the people were much excited, but he was so tired that he had gone to sleep and saw nothing. He said toward the, the end of the day, there were several priests came in to see them and the babe and gave them many, many presents. And the news got circulated that this child was to be king of the Jews. And it created such an excitement that he took the child and his mother and came to Moab for protection for fear the Romans will kill the child to keep it from being a rival to the, to the Romans. I discovered that all of Joseph's ideas were of a selfish kind. All he thought of was himself. Mary is altogether a different character, and she is too noble to be the wife of such a man. She seems to be forty or forty-five years of age, abounds with the cheerful and happy spirit, and is full of happy fancies. She is fair to see, fair, fair, rather fleshy, has soft and innocent-looking eyes, and seems to be naturally a good woman. I asked her who her parents were, and she said her father's name was Eli, and her mother's name was Anna. Her grandmother's name was Penel, a widow of the tribe of Asher, of great renown. I asked her if Jesus was the son of Joseph. She said he was not. I asked her to relate the circumstances of the child's history. She said that one day, while she was grinding some meal, there appeared at the door a stranger in shining remnant, which showed as bright as a light. She was very much alarmed at his presence and trembled like a leaf, but all her fears were calmed when she spoke to her, for he said, Mary, thou art loved by the Lord, and he has sent me to tell thee that thou shalt have a child, that this child shall be great, and rule all nations of the earth. She continued, I immediately thought of my engagement to Joseph, and supposed that that was the way the child was to come, but he astonished me the more when he told me that cousin Elizabeth had conceived and would bear a son whose name would be John, and my son should be called Jesus. This caused me to remember that uh, Zacharias had a vision and disputed with the angel, and for that he was struck with dumbness so that he could no longer hold the priest's office. I asked the messenger if Joseph knew anything of the matter. He said that he told Joseph and I was to have a child by command of the Holy Ghost, and that he was to redeem his people from their sins, and was to reign over the world, that every man should confess to him, and he should rule over the kings of the earth. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes. Let me read a little bit more here. I asked her how she knew that he was an angel, and she said he told her so. And then she knew he was an angel from the way he came and went. I asked her to describe how he went away with her, and she said that he seemed to melt away like an extinguished uh, uh, ball of light. I asked her if she knew anything of John the Baptist. She said he lived in the mountains of Judea, but last she knew of him. I asked her if he and Jesus were acquainted, or did they visit. She said she did not think they knew each other yet. Okay. So... Here we have this supposed interview, okay? Now, the fact is that we don't know if that's true or not, but it is interesting that 
there never were any. There should be records kept of what happened to Jesus, or at least that the Romans went out to investigate this. And we never hear of anything like that. Are these in the Vatican archives? If this is true, then we got a little glimpse into his personality. But what does that do to people? What did that do to you? Let's say this was true. And you heard these things that Jesus was not very friendly, Joseph was ugly. Uh, you hear this story in kind of human terms, and it takes away from this kind of uh, supernatural idea we have of Jesus. Okay, And is, is it the reason that we believe it so much? If we humanize Jesus to a point of being just like us, I mean, he did go to the bathroom. He did do things like we did, but somehow when we think of him, we don't think in those terms. And maybe, maybe, maybe the information is kept from us for that very reason. We know the Vatican hides behind Jesus, and I'm not saying for all people listening, whether it's true or not, because there are people that do not believe in the Christian story, as Christians do. The whole idea that we don't know anything about him for those years to me is troubling and I really would like to know. Now I'm not saying this is true. I'm not saying uh, that maybe it, there is no record of it for a reason or maybe the true records if this isn't true are kept in the Vatican for a reason. Back tomorrow on the Investigative Journal. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free... 1-800-375-4188.